Thank you, Roger. And uh, without any delay, I'll introduce the speakers. We'll have three talks, and then we'll have a break. And the first speaker will be uh, Steve Foreman, who's the Francis and Kathleen McNamara Distinguished Chair in Hematology and Hemopoietic Cell Transplantation at the City of Hope. And um, uh, Dr. Foreman is a longtime player in this field. He's been the, uh, uh, the head of the bone marrow transplantation program at the City of Hope since 1987. And he's the program co-leader of the City of Hope's NCI-designated Comprehensive Cancer Center Hematologic Malignancies Program and is the director of the T-Cell Therapeutics Research Laboratory. So he's been, uh, for many years, an important player in this area, and he's going to tell us about how expanding antigen-specific adoptive T-cell immunotherapy for the treatment of cancer, a very lively topic these days. Steve, thank you for coming down. All right. No, thank you, Mitch, very much. So thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here to uh, talk to you all this afternoon about some of our, our work. Um, so just to, for disclosure, we've licensed some of the things that we've done in the laboratory to a, a company called Mustang Therapeutics. So what I'm going to talk about in the time I have this afternoon is about adoptive therapy utilizing uh, engineered T cells designed to uh, um, recognize uh, cancer. This is an outgrowth of work that we were interested in for a number of years about allogeneic uh, cells and the concept of the graft versus tumor effect, which is not specific and has more targets, as you well know, than just the tumor itself. And this field was really an attempt to narrow the focus of the immune system to being something either specific to or narrowly focused within, within the tumor. And so, is that what this is? Yeah. So, in general, for people undergoing these sorts of therapies or these studies, um, T cells are isolated from uh, the, the person from the blood. Uh, we use in our lab predominantly lentiviral vector uh, transfer to introduce new genes into the cell, which are then integrated into the DNA. Um, I'll show you a little bit more detail about what the car actually looks like, but in general, this is the business end of it. It recognizes a specific uh, epitope on an antigen. Uh, through a series of uh, transmembrane uh, signaling, uh, the cell is uh, activated to recognize and do what T cells do, which is to recognize and kill, uh, kill targets. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, are variations on this. Now, just to give you an example of, of what this is about, many of you all are familiar with this. You read about in the newspaper, too, about CD19 car therapy, which has really been the poster child for the field and taking uh, T cells from people with leukemia, engineering the T cells, putting them back in, and having the, uh, the disease go away. And this is just a, a, fa a fairly dramatic example of a young woman who was referred actually from San Diego, um, who had failed all sorts of therapies, including several different transplants, and was in florid uh, relapse. And the, the cell in question here is a CD19 expressing leukemic blast, CD10 being a marker of early uh, immaturity uh, on these cells. So it is both CD19, CD10 positive. Uh, and the, we took T cells from her. We engineered them to recognize CD19. And at 14 days later, um, you can't see the, or you see very few of the CD19, CD10 cells. And so the T cells that we'd engineered mediated an anti-tumor response, and she went into remission. Um, so this is. When it works, this is what you want it to look like. And there's a lot of studies mostly done at Penn, Memorial, uh, the Hutch, other places around the country that have reproduced this sort of observation. Um, but the, the problem, and that's really what I want to talk to you all about today, is that the question for a lot of us who try to work in this field is to what extent is this a one-trick pony or is this a field? And so our lab has taken on the challenge of trying to um, determine whether we can expand, if you will, uh, CAR T cell therapy to other cancers. And that's what I'm going to focus on uh, today for you all. Uh, this just shows you the persistence of the cells. Uh, and, and we can actually detect these out a month, making up about 1% of the, the T cell population that regenerates not just having antiviral immunity, but anti-tumor immunity. So as I said, we've been focused on trying to expand the possibility to test how far can we go with this? And so we have programs, obviously, protocols under INDs for lymphoma and leukemia that are CD19. 
Uh, a trial is going to open in about five weeks for AML, focused on CD123. We're developing myeloma. I'll talk about brain tumor, breast cancer, and then other types of cancers, because leukemia, although important, is a, a relatively unusual disease. And I think we would like to see how we can expand CAR T cell therapy either by itself or in combination uh, to treat other types of cancers. So we talk about AML because this was a, a process that went on over the last three or four years uh, in our lab where we learned how to engineer cells that recognize CD123. And most of the work was done by when I went back to the lab about six years ago by my first PhD student. So I have a particular pride in, in, this, uh, uh, in this particular work. So AML, like ALL, uh, is a, a difficult disease to cure. We've spent a lot of time over the last 35 years, frankly, doing transplants to cure people who were otherwise not curable. And these were people who were predominantly not in remission. So curing them with a transplant was a, was a, was a dramatic step. Um, but the idea was to try to get people into a second remission to be able to do this, uh, because if they've relapsed, the, the disease is telling you that the chemotherapy you're using didn't do the trick, uh, and a transplant would be necessary, but transplants are usually more effective when the person's in remission. Um, and you can say here that uh, it's not so easy to do. You only do it 20% of the time if the remission was short, a little bit more if it was longer. And so this was developed as a new therapy to achieve that for a person. Uh, a colleague of mine, Craig Jordan, when he was at Rochester, identified CD123 as being uh, expressed on AML uh, stem cells compared to normal stem cells. So we wondered whether it would be possible to make a car that would have a differential effect predominantly on the leukemic cell population as opposed to the normal population. And so we, we screened a bunch of uh, patients whose cells we had access to at the City of Hope and showed that for the, the CD34 selected cells, which are, the, which are where the stem cell compartment is, um, really the uh, there were a number of patients where the vast majority of cells were CD123 expressing. So we thought, well, let's, let's explore how far we can go uh, with this. And the therapeutic concept, as you might guess and predict, is that if this is a normal stem cell and this is a leukemia stem cell, and the mutations, which is a, you know, another subject that you're familiar with, that lead this to become leukemic, the idea is could we introduce a, an immune anti-CD123 um, a therapy that would eliminate these cells, but also maybe eliminate the leukemia stem cell and, and, and cure the patient. And so we made a car uh, that was focused on the, um, the single chain uh, of the anti-CD123 antibody that would recognize the target. And through a series of engineering steps and integration into a lentiviral vector, um, we made a car that if this is the business end and this is the signaling end, uh, and I'll talk about this maybe in the question and answer period. Um, but the idea was to get activation, proliferation, and then kill targets. And th what this shows is that if you, we have cell lines that are AML, um, and we can show that um, our uh, car uh, targets uh, AML cells and doesn't target uh, cells that don't express CD123. Uh, these are the two different car T cells that we made, uh, and this is a... Um, uh, an irrelevant car we use as a control. But the point is, is that um, uh, it will kill targets in, in vitro. If you do it in vivo, where we use xenografts, where we inject uh, cells uh, into the mouse and, and basically um, create leukemia, and that's what you're seeing here. Mice have been injected and over a period of weeks. The, the leukemia spreads throughout the body. And these are mice that were treated either with a, a CAR T cell that recognized CD19, or recognize CD123, and you can see this car doesn't do anything. This uh, car gets a big response, um, and the mice live longer, and we're working on ways to try to make this uh, more durable by other things that we can talk about later. But, so it was the basis of this. We chose this particular uh, um, antibody to be the basis for our human study. Um, we also then wanted to be sure we could do this not just with cell lines, but with people's disease. And so what this is an attempt to show is that um, uh, using this car, with this construct, uh, with the SCFV, the single chain antibody, we could lyse uh, patient cells that were fresh and not a cell line. And these are three examples of this. Um, what caught our attention was this. These are uh, CD19 uh, CAR T cells. 
And they don't recognize AML, don't recognize, don't recognize. But in this, uh, it seemed to recognize um, this particular ALL, uh, our uh, uh, cells. And what it is, this happens to be an AML that expresses both CD123 and CD19, so it could be killed by, uh, by either one. But the issue for us had to do, and it was the problem for the FDA also, and when we went to the RAC, um, was that how certain were we that these CAR T cells focused on CD123 were not going to injure normal hematopoietic cells? You know, the literature says about expression, but you know, we weren't 1,000% we weren't confident in that. So we did studies where we co-cultured hematopoietic normal stem cells with our T cells to see whether we would suppress um, hematopoiesis in vitro. And it was an, just an old-fashioned count colonies. You know, mix them, see if the colonies grew. And, and what it shows is the following. If these are leukemia colonies, we could see suppression by our CAR T cells uh, in a very short assay of growth of the leukemia cells. If we look at more normal progenitor cells, we don't see a significant change between the treated and untreated, and the same thing for committed cells that make red blood cells. So it appeared that we had somewhat of a differential effect between the impact on normal hematopoiesis and, if you will, leukemic poiesis. And that led to the design of this trial. And I'll, I'll explain why this looks the way it does. So this is, again, patients with refractory AML. We're going to make T cells from them and then infuse them and then see at day 28, are they in remission? And most importantly, do they have regeneration of normal cells? Are we sure that we didn't knock off, if you will, normal hematopoietic stem cells? And so what we agreed to do, this was really our idea, but we presented it to the, to the RAC and the FDA, all patients who are going to be coming for this trial will have an identified donor. So just in case we're wrong and that the experiments don't predict and we have no leukemia but no hematopoiesis here, will simply graft them with stem cells from their matched sibling or unrelated donor, uh, which at City of Hope, as Mitch was saying, we, we've had a lot of experience in doing over a long period of time. So this is what's going to open in um, September. But as I said, this is hematopoietic. We were interested in whether we could do this outside of um, hematopoiesis. And this is work that's done looking at CAR T cells for brain tumors. And I know in looking at the posters and looking at the presentations, there's a lot of work going on and being discussed about uh, neurogenesis, and um, we're interested in, in the transformative uh, issues. So glioblastoma, as you know, is an aggressive brain tumor. Most people do not survive this. Uh, the median survival really hasn't changed a whole lot between when I started as a, a fellow and now, although there's news. And there's a challenge. It's invasive. They're heterogeneous. They're barriers to getting agents into the brain. And the question is, can CAR T cell therapy address this? And so through a lot of sort of preclinical work, we identified the IL-13 receptor alpha-2 uh, uh, receptor as being a target for glioblastoma. And this summarizes that. Um, it's a high affinity receptor expressed on more than half of GBMs. Um, it's low activity or no activity on normal brain. And it's distinct from a second receptor, which is receptor alpha-1. And so we made, in this case, what's called a zetakine, because it's not really an antibody. It's really the, um, the ligand for the receptor that we're targeting, or the receptor itself. Um, and this just shows you the expression of IL-13 receptor alpha-2 in the brain. It also expresses HER2 and EGFR. Um, but our focus, at least in these early experiments, has been on this particular target. OK. So we actually did a phase one trial a few years ago. We made T cell clones, actually, CD8 clones, that we would inject not in the peripheral blood, but directly into the brain itself. Um, let's see if I have this right. This is a, it was called a first generation. So this was the first trial we did. And then we made an allogeneic product uh, that we put in the brain. We were looking for the possibility of not having to make cell product for every single patient, but to make it one that we use for many. And so we did these two trials. And the gist of it was that we actually could, in, that this is the tumor, this is the scan, and then we would inject the, the T cells directly into the cavity or right where the brain tumor was. And what we saw was regression of the tumor cell by the direct injection of the tumor cells. 
Now, the problem in GBM, as most of you all know, is that this is not the only site of disease. There's disease here, 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 that's all over. These cells, tumor cells migrate throughout the brain. And so the issue for us is how do we get the cells to chase the other areas beyond where we are injecting them? And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in just a second. So we learned that it was feasible, tolerable. Nobody had a bad uh, reaction. It told us we could actually work in the brain as a space without causing uh, harm, at least at the moment. So we spent a long time, without going into a lot of detail, to try to optimize uh, the T cell to be um, more proliferative, more cytolytic, and it may be used less uh, cell numbers. Because what we need, what the field will always tell you is, you need expansion and persistence for there to be truly a, um, uh, a persistent uh, anti-tumor uh, response in the brain. So we've made a second generation where we changed the linker, uh, where we changed the co molecule from CD28 to 41BB, uh, and then did experiments that we, we will show you here. And it shows that uh, when we inject the next generation, we actually get, at a lower cell dose, uh, as good, if not better, uh, tumor kill in the brains of mice. And these are mice that have been injected with human, uh, lines that we made from primary tumors that were resected, and then we established a cell line and used them, and you can see um, that the percent survival was higher here than in our first. So at a lower cell dose, we actually got better tumor kill because I think the cells are more potent and they expanded. And one of the reasons I can show you that is that um, if this, this is a biopsy from some of these uh, animals, you can see in the first generation, if the brown is the, um, you know, the uh, evidence, these are T cells uh, in the brain, the first generation, you don't see many, but in our next generation, you see them uh, a month later uh, in the brain persisting. And so that's what we want to happen in a human, to say the least. And so that trial has opened, actually. We treated our first patient who was doing well, um, and we'll see what happens over time as we go uh, further. Um, So one of the things that we've learned is, so far is we can't, what we find is if we give these cells intravenously, they don't seem to traffic to the brain. We are, so we're not confident that that's going to be a good way in which to try uh, to deliver them. So we have, we have been focusing predominantly on intra-tumoral uh, uh, or work that I'll show you in a moment, uh, putting it actually in just to the, uh, the CSF, into the ventricle or the spinal fluid. And the cells actually do something remarkable, which I'll show you in just a moment. I'm going to move past this. So this is the clinical trial that we have that's open right now, where we leukophorese the patient. They undergo their surgery. We put a catheter in the cavity, and we put T cells, T cells, T cells, and then um, reevaluate. And this is the uh, um, uh, this is where that patient patient is right now. Okay. So I'm just going to show you another example. I mean, you can see this repetitive theme. We're trying to identify antigens and then trying to identify therapy. And this is another disease, myeloma, that I'm sure many of y'all are familiar with. Um, current therapies induce remission, but most patients succumb over increasingly longer periods of time. And the issue is, can we find antigens that would be targetable in this disease? And it turns out there are. Um, and these are three examples of them. This is B-cell maturation antigen. I'm sure y'all are familiar with this because this is a stem cell marker that we use uh, in the lab. But we have, based on our screening of a lot of myeloma samples, focused on CS1. This identified predominantly on plasma cells and not much else, maybe on NK cells, um, but uh, not much beyond that. This is that idea that you want a target that is not on other cells so you don't get off-target toxicity, which is the, the concern. And this just shows you an example of a mouse model that we have of myeloma. Uh, where it's established, then we put the CAR T cells in on day zero, and you can see that the untreated mice, the mock where we give T cells that don't have the uh, um, transgene in them, and our CS1 translated CARs, at a month we have mice in, in remission. And so we're developing this to um, treat myeloma patients in the year 2016 uh, with, with CAR T cells. Now, let me just sort of finish and show you a couple of things, because on my, you're sitting here because I'm going to see a time thing. Right, OK. So as you look at the field of cancer immunotherapy, it's clear that with checkpoint inhibitors and vaccines and antibodies and immunoconjugates, there's a lot of things that are going on. 
Um, but there's, there are challenges that I've, I've, I've highlighted. Um, one, that you have to identify an antigen that you can target that doesn't target normal cells and get into uncontrolled uh, toxicity. The microenvironment is hostile even to our T cells. So we've done experiments to show that the microenvironment itself is inhibitory and can shut down our T cell efficacy too in some situations. So we know we're going to need to either engineer the T cell a different way or use combined modality therapy, which is what we are pursuing right now. So that's why we're focusing on these targets, HER2, which I'll show you some work in just to end, um, L1 cam and ovary. Uh, and EGFRB3, which is uh, also in brain. And for us, we're gonna probably going to use combined antigen therapy in the brain, since it appears to be a site we can do without having to worry too much about off-target uh, effects. All right. So let me just conclude by showing you one other example. Um, I have a personal interest in women's cancers over the course of my life and career. And so doing something in breast cancer was fairly important for our lab, and we focus on HER2 an oncogene that's overexpressed and amplified in breast cancer. There are clinical trials with all sorts of agents. Um, but there was one CAR T cell uh, trial that resulted in a death of the NCI, which kind of paused the, the field for, for a while. But we wondered, since brain metastasis are a very common consequence of having this particular type of brain cancer, whether we could take what we learned in brain tumors and apply it to women who have breast cancer uh, where the disease has migrated to the brain. And so we've done experiments now to make HER2-specific CAR T cells to treat brain metastasis, modeling it on what we had done in, the, um, uh, in brain tumors. And the point here is that we have different lines that are either high, excuse me, negative for HER2, low for HER2 expression, or very high expression. And we can make T cells that, as you can see going across here, uh, depending upon the level of expression, we get um, uh, better killing. What we're trying to do is separate as best we can what the, tel what the T cell sees in a high expressing tumor versus a low expressing normal tissue to try to get additional safety, and, and that's what these experiments were, were done for. But what we show is if we put these cells in the ventricle of the, of, in this case, the mouse, uh, instead of directly into the brain, we get we get some of the best killing, we, it all goes away. And I think it's, we're, what we're exploring is whether by putting the cells into this fluid which percolates through the brain, whether we'll get our T cells to go where other sites of disease are as opposed to injecting it in one site and not being certain whether they're just gonna sit there, do their killing and they're done, or whether they could in fact migrate through the brain. And so we're developing this and hope to have this as a trial in 2016 or 2017 for women with breast cancer who have this unfortunate uh, um, uh, outcome. As an ending, we are starting to explore experimentally and in clinical trials a variety of ways to combine our T cells, which are our effector, and will lyse tumor targets with agents that will suppress those tumor-driven, elaborated things that get in the way whether it's activation of PD-1 on our T cells or um, <coughs> inhibitory cytokines, uh, matrix of the tumor like in pancreatic cancer where it makes its own barrier. Cervical cancer does exactly the same thing. And our own institution, as you may know, has been very focused on a transcription factor called STAT3, which seems to be a central, has a central role in the elaboration of these inhibitory molecules. And we have made uh, molecules that will inhibit this which augments both adoptive and adaptive uh, tumor, anti-tumor responses. And so we're going to be combining STAT3 inhibition with engineered T cells for purposes of combined modality of therapy in people uh, with cancer. All right. And I'll stop here. I just want to, as I'm sure everybody does, is acknowledge my rather remarkable and lab group that I'm very proud of. As you probably can tell in our own group, we have, it's a mixture of both translational science, clinical science, and basic science. And so in this group are laboratory investigators, clinicians, statisticians, scientists, technicians, and uh, they make me proud every day. So thank you very much.
So the question is about tumor lysis. Could we get so much activity that um, we have problems in the brain? I think we, there's two things. There's tumor lysis and there's the cytokine storm that comes. So we have a pretty good handle on how to manage the cytokine storm with um, uh, various uh, constructs that are available and that we've made. Um, tumor lysis in the brain, I, I just don't think is going to be a problem because we radiate things in the brain and don't see that type of phenomena. With AML, we are clearly worried both about lysis and the cytokine release uh, syndrome, and we are, you know, we, we stay there. We don't leave uh, for about two days just to be sure that's not going to happen. Um, in the animal model where you're injecting directly into the ventricles, are you seeing the cells percolating through the recently uh, described brain phatics or the lymphatics of the brain, or are they just moving through the parenchyma? How are they getting to the target? So the question is about how these cells move in the brain. I went to our chief of neurosurgery when we had this idea to get a better sense of, because I'm learning this as I go too to some degree, is how the CSF goes through the brain. Um, so I'm, uh, as, a, as a means for how cells might migrate through. I can tell you, though, that I know that by not injecting directly into the tumor, things get smaller if not go away. So they had to have gotten there, but how they get there, I, I, I could maybe learn from you. And when you come up, we can talk more, more about that. But it's just an observation. If we understood more, I'd like to be able to take advantage of whatever the rationale is for that. But right now, you know, because we put what's called myo reservoirs in people, uh, where you can inject things in the ventricle all the time, we think that's where we're going to put the cells, and then it gives us ready access to sample it and, and then see. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.